So today uh, I'm going to talk about as Paul said uh, about the application of wave field and wave field based processing sequence uh, for constructing the velocity models. Uh, this application uh, arises from uh, this data set kindly provided by CG Veritas and brought to us by Bruce West last semester, the good news that we got that uh, data set. And uh, it started from the class project from Gerhard's class. So Gerhard suggested, hey Eugene, why don't you use this data set instead of the synthetic data set? And that's how this started. So after uh, Gerhard's visit, we continue, uh, uh, we build upon our results and improve a little bit. And to today, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So in wave field based tomography, as Paul introduced in the previous talk, uh, we can take advantage of uh, different uh, sensitivities of the objective function. So some objective functions are better for retrieving some parts of the model, and others uh, improve other parts of the model. So it turns out that uh, we have complementary uh, uh, contributions for each objective function. So let me illustrate uh, this fact with a very simple 1D example, simpler than uh, what Paul showed before. This is a, uh, an objective function uh, where the modeling operator is just a shift of the observed data, which in this case is a, a tapered sine function. So if we include the time shift operator, we move the, the observed data in, in red, and then we can compare with the, uh, uh, sorry, the model data in red with the observed data in blue. And if we build the objective function with this very simple model, this very simple modeling operator, uh, this is how the objective function looks like as a function of time lag and frequency. As you can see, yeah, this is a very simple 1D example the objective function is quite complex. If we are lucky to have a uh, very low frequencies, in this case around uh, one hertz, we can converge to the global minimum, which is delta t delta tau equal to zero. However, if we start at a higher frequency, we start getting the local minimal contributions uh, for the problem, and this is our final result. If we start from there. However, instead of uh, uh, measuring the dynamic information of the, these two uh, functions, we can uh, take a look at the uh, kinematic misfit between them by using a correlation-based objective function, as Paul explained in the last presentation. The objective function for this very simple 1D inversion looks much more simpler. So from here, if we start from the same place where we didn't converge for the difference, we can converge to this global minimum solution at delta tau equal to zero. Here, the, the final dot is way bigger than the initial because I want to em em emphasize the fact that uh, the objective function at this location is quite flat. So we don't get the resolution that we can get with the data difference. However, this solution uh, can put us in the vicinity of the global minimum. And then, for instance, we can take this model and use it in the data difference to further refine the result. So that leads me into the, the similarities of this very simple example with wave field tomography. So in wave field tomography, the correlation, what well, was the correlation of two 1D functions, now we are correlating wave fields, as Paul explained in the last presentation. So here we are uh, doing a spatial correlation so lambda is a space lag, and then we sum over all the experiment indexes. Index. This could be shot, shot gathers or length waves or anything that you like for an experiment index. So this, these correlation functions, as Paul explained before, give, give us information about the velocity model. For instance, this is how a a space like that looks like for a low velocity anomaly 
for a correct velocity, we can see that the, gather, the energy of the gallery is correctly focused at lambda x equal to zero. And in, for a high velocity, the, the events are over-migrated and in focus again. So taking advantage of that uh, fact that when we have a, a energy of South zero lag is an indicator that we have problems with the velocity, we can use this penalty function introduced by Penchen and, and Bill Sainz a few years ago. Penchen was met yesterday here. And uh, this objective function has been uh, also further explored here at COVP as well, with the work by Tong Lin Yang and also uh, Clement and, and, and Francesco did some exploration, not with this type of uh, correlation, but with uh, directional correlation functions. So here we can obtain from this objective function, we can obtain these long wavelength components for, for the model. And then we can move to the data domain difference. And now, as you can see here, we change from uh, time to frequency. And this is, as you can imagine, where Gerhard came in into the project. So we have the full effort inversion in the frequency domain. But there is really no, not much difference between them. The frequency domain uh, implementation for fuel for inversion gives us some uh, uh, advantages for selecting different objective functions. But in general, it's the same. So the model is the model data and the opposite is the observed data. So we can also, since we are in the frequency domain, we can compare the phase of both uh, model data and observed data by uh, using the argument function, which gives us the phase information for each, each of them. So this objective function also has a different sensitivity as the data difference, which contain amplitude and phase information. So with all this background uh, in mind, uh, we can move on to the field data example. So let me tell you more about the data set that, that we got. So these are two the data set streamer data set, and it has a variable depth cable. The variable depth cable uh, enhances the frequency response of the data set, as I will further explain to you later. In the right, you can see the, the average spectrum for this shot gather. And you can see we have data more or less up to in the hundreds hertz. And for the, however, for the a data domain implementation, we only use a band-limited version of this full data set. We, migrate, we inverted up to approximately up to 9 hertz. So in the right shows you the filter we apply for, for this, uh, for retrieving these low frequencies of the, of the data. So why this uh, low uh, Variable data streamer cable is good for fuel for inversion. Well, in the top is what we, the streamer that we have for this data set, and in the bottom could be a conventional streamer with a fixed depth. So we propagate a, an incident plane wave, vertically incident plane wave, into this cable. In the top panel, this is the notch response you would obtain for, for, for this cable, and in the bottom panel, is the notch response that you would obtain for. A, the fixed streamer depth cable. So if we compute the composite notch response for the cable, that was we obtain in the top, and in the bottom is the convention. As you can see, we get a, a very low frequency response. Sadly, our data, well, any marine data, shallow marine data contains swell noise, so we don't have the luxury of getting uh, those close to zero hertz uh, information. However, our, our low frequency data is, is quite good for this data set. So from now on, I'm going to show you a very di a three different versions of our model. So we have a starting model, and then we have a model that we build with a image domain tomography, and we have a model that we can build from a data domain tomography. So that there are two paths from a starting model to data domain model. We can start 
from starting and going directly to a data domain model, or we can take the, to, to build the components of our model, we can go from a starting model to image domain model and then go to data domain model. So from now on, S is the starting model, I is the image domain model, and D is the data domain model. So this is the starting velocity model. Uh, we built this model by doing some uh, uh, time domain animal analysis and convert it to that, smooth, etc. So this is a starting model. It's very smooth and we hope to uh, add information uh, with the uh, dead domain processing sequence that I will show you now. This is the RTN image for the starting model. You can see that uh, we have a lot of signs of over-migration, especially in the deepest part of the image. You can identify them throughout the image. Uh, the three arrows show some very evident points of over-migration in this data set with this model. And this image uh, shows you the, uh, at the sparse mm -hmm. location the angle gathers computed for this velocity model. Now you can see in the, ag in the angle gathers that we have evident over-migration uh, more or less below three kilometers in depth throughout the section. I want to point out that uh, we're using the angle gathers only for uh, visualization purposes. In the tomography, we use the space like gathers. However, I think it's easier to understand the, the kinematics uh, by looking at angle gathers. So at that location I showed you before, the red line, this is the space like gather for that location, and this is how the angle gather looks like. So both gathers contain equivalent information. There is just a, a, a linear operator that makes a difference between them. So that's why I'm showing you only the angle gather from now on. So let me give you some uh, feedback about the, our strategy for uh, data domain to tomography. Uh, we use seven frequency blocks spanning from around two hertz to nine hertz. Uh, we use tan damping to, to focus mostly on, on the uh, diving wave arrivals of the data. And from, from now, for now, we are using the phase different objective function, but we are working in, in improving using other objective functions in the data domain. So if we go directly from the starting model to data domain model, this is the inversion result we obtain. Uh, you can see that in general, the long wavelength components of the model were not affected by the inversion. We added some uh, details into the model. However, the, the image uh, still shows evidence of over-migration and high-velocity anomaly in the model. So the gathers also show this over-migration and the velocity is still too high for uh, most of the section. If we go to image domain tomography, and, and here I use a, a precondition of the gradient to obtain a, a smooth component of the model, now you can see we added a lot of long wavelength uh, additions into the model that impacted quite a bit the image, especially below three kilometers in depth. If we look at the gathers, now you can see that uh, most of them are uh, corrected in, in areas where before we saw a lot of over-migration uh, evidence in the events. I forgot to point out that this data set contains uh, software related multiples as well, so that's why you could see some conflicting move outs in some of the guys. If we go there, uh, from image domain to the data domain result, now you can see that uh, our velocity model contains uh, a lot of details. Again, uh, we didn't add much low wavelength components. 
and the uh, the velo the image didn't change uh, much at, at the first side, but then we will compare them, and you will see some uh, nice features of these new images. However, in, in, if we look at the gathers, we can see in some places where uh, we had a flat gathers with the image of main model, now we are getting some move out. So the data domain inversion in this area is, of course, there are different objective functions that seek uh, different uh, uh, comparisons of the wave fields. And now you can see that in, in this part where the arrows are pointing, we uh, have more move out than with the image domain model. So we compare just the images to see how the sequence changes throughout the, the, the process. This is a starting RTM data domain. Go back on for a few times. Starting data domain. Starting data domain tomography. You can see that in general, uh, the structure of the image got flatter in, in some areas of the model, especially, for instance, between 20 and 26 kilometers. Data domain, starting. However, when, when we move to the image domain image, we can see a lot of changes. Starting, sorry, starting image, uh, data domain, Starting uh, image domain data image domain data image domain, and then when we move from uh, the last path of our sequence image domain to data domain, we can see some changes as well. Again, you can identify. Uh, a lot of structural changes, especially around 2.7 kilometers in depth. Now the the event looks much flatter than with the image domain model, and this is interesting because uh, even though we add a lot of complexity into the velocity model, as we will compare later on, the structure, the geology of the section is simplified now with the image domain model. Although it's, di it's difficult to compare them because, well, they seek, they have different objectives. In one, we're comparing the, the phase difference, and in the other, we're comparing the focusing of uh, space lab gathers, or equivalently, the flatness of uh, angle gathers. So now let's compare the, the velocity models. So this is a, start this is a, a starting model. <coughs> This is the result from going directly from starting to data domain tomography. Starting data domain tomography. Starting data domain. So you can see that we didn't uh, add a lot of long wavelength details into the model. However, the model changed quite a bit, especially in the shallow part. So now when we go to the image domain model, you can see that we slow quite a bit uh, throughout the section. And when we move forward to the last step in the in of our sequence, you can see that now the velocity model has a lot of details, a lot of layers come into the, into the model. And the, again, the it looks like the, the structure in the velocity model didn't change uh, much, but as we compared previously with the images, this last velocity model had a lot of impact in the structure of the image, even though we added a lot of complexity into, into the model. So uh, uh, as for now, I have shown you comparisons in the image domain. So we are accustomed to that. 
And now, but it's not fair to, to do this comparison when we're talking of data domain tomorrow. So now we're, I'm showing you some comparisons in the data. So in the left panel, you can see the model uh, shot gathers. In the middle, the observed data. And in the right panel, the difference between them. So this is for the starting model. This is after uh, you can focus your attention on the right hand, right side, right hand side panel. So starting data domain, starting data domain tomography. Now when we move to uh, image domain tomography, again the left is the model data, in the middle observed data, in the right is the difference. And when we move forward to the last step of data domain tomography, so image domain. Uh, data domain tomography, image domain, data domain tomography. And now we can compare both data domain results. They are, uh, in general, both models fit pretty well the waveform at intermediate and far, and far offsets. The, the mean speed didn't change much in that area. However, in the middle and uh, in the intermediate and short offsets, you can see quite a bit of change. So this data domain coming from image, uh, from the starting, from image, from the starting, from image, from the starting. So in that regard, you can see that uh, our last data domain model uh, improved the misfit between the waveforms in this range of offsets. Another quality control that we can do in, in the data domain side is to compare the waveforms for modeling. So the first step in, in full effort inversion is to, uh, or in least square migration as uh, Simon showed yesterday, is to obtain the source function. So since we know that the, the vessel, the streamer data, the vessel uh, release has an ergon that probably releases a, a fairly constant amount of uh, air into the water. We can expect that the inverted source waveform should be consistent throughout the, the, the shooting line. So these are the inverted waveforms, source waveforms for every shot throughout the line for the starting model. And this is for the model after uh, data domain tomography. So starting data domain tomography, starting data domain tomography. So you can see that we improve a lot the consistency of the waveforms, especially where now all the waveforms have the, the same starting time throughout the, the line, and they are fairly consistent. For inversion, we only use one sort of function. We stack all of these uh, inverted source functions. So we apply the same for the image domain model. So now you can see that the image domain inverted source functions are more consistent from the beginning. And when, as when we move on to uh, the final step in the, in the sequence, and we obtain the last model, uh, the waveforms are further improve and they are fairly consistent sorry throughout the line so uh, in this presentation I have shown you uh, an application to this uh, to the data set that uh, CGG kindly provide us and is an application based on wave fields and is in the line of what Paul discussed in the last presentation so we exploited some features of some objective functions and another features of the data domain objective functions. And I, we believe that these features are complementary. Of course, uh, there is a lot of work still to uh, fill all the gaps in the, in the model. And another good feature of a uh, wavefield-based model building is that 
Uh, we are using this wave operator that is consistent with uh, the bandwidth of our data. And this scale separation can be used to construct all the uh, components of the model. <coughs> These objective functions that I discuss here in this application are complementary. We use the uh, space lagars tom uh, tomography for building the smooth part of the model. And then we build the sharp components of the model with uh, data domain tomography. The hope in this process is to reduce cycle skipping. However, as, uh, as you saw in the presentation, uh, there are some places where we saw some consistency with the image domain model. And then when we, in the data domain model, we saw in some areas that the gathers uh, were not as flat as with the image domain model. So yeah, it has to be a place somewhere in between that uh, we can satisfy both observations in the image domain and in the data domain. And this leads to the, well, the current and future world uh, with this data set. So we are testing different objective functions and uh, different penalty operators in both image domain and uh, the data domain side. With that, uh, I would like to acknowledge Bruce Berg West for all the support with the data set, explaining us the geometry and all the background information with the data set, and more importantly, all the permissions for publication and uh, all this process. And I would like to acknowledge CJJ for uh, providing us this data set. With that, I would like to thank you all and welcome the questions. Thank you.